everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Law Poetry Podcast, where today I am going to be talking a little bit about current events in um, Poetic Anarchy Press land, and then uh, I'm going to be reading some comments, and then I will probably read a poem since that is something that's come up again that i don't read any poems on this fucking poetry podcast so we are going to do all that well first off i want to give a big shout out to adam crawford who is awesome and who's been in um, a couple issues of the blood rag um i think i think issue nine and issue 10 if i'm not mistaken he's a badass motherfucker and um him and his buddies were down in long beach um going to some punk show um and adam what show were you at and was it at alex's bar like like where were you what was happening and him and his buddies got a bunch of copies of the blood rag and went and put them all over town and let me see if I could pull it up on here. Hey, everybody. This is a, a sponsorship to Hickey for uh, <laughs> Matt Wall's, uh, Matt Wall's uh, label, Poetic Anarchy Press. He's got this nifty little thing called the blood rag. It's like a sheet he puts out one. Let's go. Okay. We're gone. Go make sure we do that. Adam said don't yeah. do this. <laughs> hey, guys. Adam said don't do this, but we're going to do it anyways. We're repping the blood rag out by fucking uh, I hate Matt Walsh and Poetic Anarchy Press. We're bringing real poet. Oh man, why is it doing that? Okay, let, let me see if I can actually go to it. I don't know why it's not playing all the way through, but anyway, so the dude um, put uh, the blood rag under the windshield of a police cruiser um, on the street there in Long Beach, and that's hysterical. <laughs> and they put it all over um, a couple of the buildings around there at Alex's bar. Um, and then they left some in a stall in a restroom, which is great because people need something to read when they're dropping. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, Adam um, and your fucking crew, man, thank you guys for doing that. As much as I, it's so funny because like I was like, okay, so I'm gonna tell people not to put these things on police cars, and now, now that I'm doing this, all I want to do is tell you guys to put those on police cars. Ugh. Let's see if I get any fucking submissions from a sergeant or anything like that. That would be nice, wouldn't it, guys? Okay, so that happened. I saw that yesterday and was just cracking up. That was great. I uh, did the uh, interview for Slee Ricketts since the last time we spoke, I think. I did not ask Matt those questions that I said I was going to ask him, and I have now forgotten what they were. So that is something I'm going to have to um, go back and look at my notes and see. And then yesterday I had a lovely, lovely talk with um, Alice Allen from Poetry Says. It was a really good talk, and something that came up while we were talking and it's funny because when you do interviews and stuff it's sometimes hard to remember exactly what you said even though you remember how you feel if that makes any sense like i remember like the feelings and emotions i had with or about some of the things we were talking about. I, I remember that way more than I remember the words that actually came out of my mouth. In the last episode I did, it was about, um, and all of this is going to tie together, so just bear with my rabbit trails here. I did an episode called, like, Lit Journals Are Doomed. I was reading this article. I, I was just mortified. Um, by a lot of the stuff that is very normal for a huge subset of poets because that is the world that they were brought up in 
Like that was the poetry world they were brought up in. These were the norms. These are the things that were okay. And to me, a lot of that stuff seems foreign. Like it just seems like, like, like how is that like your best idea here? Like that just doesn't make any fucking sense. And I've gotten some comments on that episode and not as many as I thought I would. After I recorded the episode, I thought I should say some stuff in the comments of that thread, which was fucking stupid. A lot of the comments on this thread were kind of just, I don't know, up ass. Like, it just, like, um, D.P. Snyder said, I appreciate the transparency of Christine's essay. I also understand that writing grants is the pits and barely seems useful. That said, as a former administrator of a nonprofit, I also know that there are ways to appeal. Okay, so, like, this person is someone who's in the exact same world, or at least used to be in the same world, is um, Christine here. We also organize a lot of events. It's exhausting work, but that's what being a nonprofit takes. Okay, so, Snyder, you're, you're killing it here. That's true. Should magazines be nonprofit? Has anyone considered a more entrepreneurial approach to lit mags? Added to that is the difficulty of the contemporary landscape. Lit mags seem to be like islands in a river during a spring melt losing ground rapidly. There seem to be less serious readers. Does anyone really know? Um, less space for more entrance in the scene. Everyone wants to be a lit mag editor, but no one wants to create a workable business plan. Oh, Snyder, I had you pegged wrong. You killed it. There you go. So you you did well. Um, okay, so now we have um, Lev Raphael. Um, thanks for writing about the subject without dissing writers. But they did diss writers. They did. Um, your post was reasoned and reasonable. And I don't think it was. Like, I think this post was trying to normalize the fact that lit mags are going to ask you for money to submit. I, I wasn't even going to start reading all of these other people's um, comments. Actually, I'm going to come back to that because I, oh, I have another um, comment that I got that kind of goes along that thing. Okay, let's see more comments here. Somebody left like a really smart comment that like went after the stuff that this article said and I'm going to read it and this is by someone named No. It says, sorry, but I feel like charging fees is an inherently exploitive and illegitimate practice. When you do that, the author is your customer, not your producer or collaborator. And what you're selling is a writing credit for a writer, not a magazine for a reader. Oh, fuck. Shots fired, man down, man down. Oh, my God. No, you killed it. Oh, that is such a good line. I'm going to remember that forever. Okay. Um, there were so many good little journals out there well before you could conveniently charge a credit card to submit work. We are to believe that you can't survive without it when they did for decades. Boom. The job of magazine publishers is to find readers and funders. Any business or nonprofit needs to market itself, but editors don't seem to want to do that. So few seem to put more effort into that than to justify the exploitation of authors. This long essay seems to indicate you're no exception. How much effort you've put into this tells me that you know in your heart this isn't justified. You need to rationalize it to yourself. Oh, fuck. Given your own accounting of your expenses and your income, it's laughable to say you pay your authors. It's your customers, authors who want a shot at being published, who are paying them. But why bother with all that work of marketing a sustainable publication when you and your peers can instead collude to dictate the market? 
i.e. one that charges your producers for the privilege of you reading us. And then it says, Becky, I'm frankly upset at you giving this crap a platform. Oh! <laughs> um, and I guess Becky is the um, editor of Lit Mag News. Oh, shit. No, you killed it. Okay, and then this is the shit. This is the fucking shit, dude. This is the thing that everyone talks about. And this is why in the episode I did about the submission fees or whatever a couple weeks ago, this kind of shit came up. So here you go. So Lauren Lovato Coin said, I'd like to know how much of your own time you offer to the mags that need help. Do you read 10 to 20 hours a month for them for free? Have you done layout because you love it? As someone who has worked on both sides of this debate, I found it's often the people who have not stayed up till 3 a.m. for weeks on end to make a magazine exist who bark the loudest. This is um, kind of like a dog whistle argument here, okay? Like, there is plus side, okay, oh, how do I say this? There are two types of people who are going to argue this point. There are the types of people who are going to be pissed off that you are charging anything for submissions because they don't want to fucking pay it. And then there are the people like No here who explain how what you are doing is trying to normalize extortion. Well, let me get to No's comment here to that. Then No said, sorry, but there's a big difference between working for free and charging someone so that they can do the work for you. Then Joyce Reynolds Ward popped in the middle of this and said, so why is it that submission fees are exclusive to, lit to the literary genre? There are science fiction and fantasy magazines out there with strong literary inclinations that don't charge fees. The difference they run funding mechanisms that aren't dependent upon the kindness of corporate sponsors. I wouldn't even say corporate sponsors. I would say out of the kindness of fucking writers who want to get their fucking shit in. Um, or for a contest example, two novel contests, the self-published science fiction competition, the self-published fantasy blog off and a new competition for novellas that starts up this fall, 300 books, all volunteer, no monetary prizes. Either literary genre um, doesn't possess the dedication of genre folks, or they need to get off their rears and figure out how to replicate the um, sci-fi fantasy process. No, it's, it's just that the literary world is used to people handing them large amounts of money for doing relatively not a whole lot because that is the world of the privileged elite. And now that the privileged elite can't pay their fucking bills, they don't know what the fuck to do and they don't understand. Oh, so I could just like, do any other business model. Like, I'm not trying to be a dick here, but any of you could go on YouTube and look up like a business 101 class or marketing 101 and probably figure out more in the three to eight minutes that those videos are than you have the whole time you've been doing a lit mag. Like, this isn't fucking rocket science at all. And for those of you who were like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Here, here's something I'm going to say to you. And this is like basic shit. Look at um, ads or billboards or whatever. Go to McDonald's and see what they are offering, how they are telling you you need it, and how much they are asking for it. Um, whatever ads pop up in your YouTube feed when you're watching this video or ads that pop up on whatever it is that you're looking at. See what they're offering you. And when they're selling you a cheeseburger, they're not selling you a cheeseburger. They're selling you like satisfaction. They're selling you quick, like instant gratification. Like when you look at like 
if you're looking through a magazine and you see like a Versace ad with um, some hot chick looking cool, like walking somewhere, they're not selling you whatever the fuck the Versace thing is. They're selling you the lifestyle. They're selling you what this is. Take a fucking hint from these people and find out what your magazine actually gives people and don't do it like this. Well, you have to get this so you can support the arts because I'm going to tell you something, sister, you are not the arts. The art is the art that needs the support, not you. And if you show that you do not know how to run anything, there are other ways people could support the arts than lining your fucking pockets. So you could mismanage and hire a hundred people every year. It, it, oh my God. Okay. I'm getting all mad again. What the fuck? And then Lauren says to Joyce, I will say in visual arts, there are also sub fees. I also want to note that self-publishing is also a hot topic too, with its own set of issues. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? Do not try to deflect here. You made some statements. People are asking you questions about them and you have to answer them. Okay, so how do you answer this question? Oh, great question. I will say that something else does something. Oh, and don't get me started on self-publishing because that has no one asked you to get on that. So then Joyce says, excuse me, we are not discussing visual arts. Thank you, Joyce. Um, there's an entire tradition in writing where money should flow to the writer, not the writer paying for publication. In fact, submission fees flies in the face of writing tradition. Boom! Self-publishing is an entirely different situation because in that case, the author is also acting as the publisher and has control over all aspects of their work's production and promotion. The author has agency in this case, not so for the writer paying submission fees only to be rejected. Note, um, I am a hybrid writer and they talk about their stuff right there. So then I said, I just want to say you're acting like Christine Mall Rice is a saint for doing this. This is her chosen profession. This is what editors do. All this article proved is that she does her job badly. Complaining about grants, not getting backers, paying too much for internet. It's just bad. Plus those fake testimonials from her editors, which just prove that one, they don't know how to do their job. And two, the propaganda and trying to normalize writers paying to submit which is even crazier in this time where the internet has basically made lit mags obsolete if you don't believe me you are reading this comment on the internet this is really just privileged upper crust bs and then lauren with the dog whistle of the century says it just kills me how riled up so many of y'all are getting about lit mags and their fees when y'all also have all the answers. Yes, go forth and self-publish for free. Why are you also invested in making this fight when you have all the answers? Opt out. Do it for free. Sow your wild success and rub our noses in it. Right? Right. And then I said, hey, Lauren, thanks for your reply to my comment. I actually run a small press and support myself through my writing. I actually have a podcast where I just talked about this. If you'd like to come on my show and debate me over this, I would love to hear what you have to say. I don't charge submission fees, and I don't try to lure wealthy the wealthy into backing my projects. I actually make money by selling products. So, yeah, I have all the answers. Let me know if you want to be on my show. And then... <laughs> And then um, she says, heck yeah, love this. Prefer to switch to email for any of that arranging, though. Um, also, prefer the tone of the second message here. So if if the debate is respectful, I'm in. If it's a gotcha type style, I win, then I'm not. So it's up to you, really. So then I sent her an email and showed her the show and said, listen to this. And if you want to be on, be on. And I haven't heard back from her. And maybe she's busy. It's fucking Memorial Day weekend, you know. Um, but after hearing how I just talked about her here, she probably won't want to come on. So that kind of sucks. But um, And then let's see. Kathy Bryant says, um, Lauren, your comment was sarcastic and asked a question. You can't blame people for answering it. As for taking it up with Christine... I have, but you did ask the question, so... And then Kathy also said to Lauren, 
Um, Hi, Lauren. I do. I submit to hundreds of lit mags and my publisher who don't charge fees and yet survive. It isn't easy for them, but it's part of the job. I've had four books and over 200 pieces published and paid for without paying a penny in submission fees for publication costs. Oh, and I've won thousands of dollars and other fantastic prizes, a holiday in Rome, for example from my writing competitions and literary award wins 33 so far damn none of which required an entry fee where would you like your nose to be rubbed (laughs) oh kathy swinging damn and then this this awesome fucking dude here said um it's also worth noting that submittable is not necessary to run a literary a literary magazine totally um, there were some great comments in there, but a lot of the comments in here are people going, oh, wow, thanks for the behind the scenes. I had no idea like how hard it is to run. a." Ma- Christine didn't say how hard it was to run a magazine. Christine said how hard it was to get handouts. Like, I don't understand why people don't understand that. Like, and dude, I'm not trying to say handouts are bad. What I'm trying to say is if the handouts aren't coming Figure out a way to make your magazine work instead of blaming writers and philanthropists who don't want to give you money. It's not that people don't want to support the arts. It's that you are doing a bad job of people wanting to support you. I don't understand why this is so fucking hard to understand. (sighs) Okay, so moving over to um, my neck of the woods here. So here's a comment that... um, Um, And this is from Jeff Taylor. Um, He says, I read this when it hit my email. I think a bunch of nonprofits were splitting that money. Not sure how much, um, I'm not sure how much each place got. Okay, and if that's true, then I apologize for that, for assuming that they were getting $140,000 each. Um, If they weren't, they weren't. And then he says, after reading this and a few others, I kind of see their point. It costs money and energy to put out a good magazine. I don't think a few dollars for a submission fee is too much to ask. Now, here is the problem. You don't think a few dollars for a submission fee is too much to ask because this person is saying how much they need it. And you're like, well, and you're a fucking good hearted fucking person. So, of course, you're going to be like, well, yeah, that's not too much to ask. But if every fucking magazine asked for this money, there will come a point when you feel like you can't support all these magazines just for you to send a submission fee in. You are being charged a fee for a literary credit that you might not even get. You know, if it's hard to run a magazine, then figure out a way to make that magazine not hard to run. There are tons of genres out there that do not charge fees. There are poetry magazines that don't charge fees, and those are the bigger ones usually, or the very small ones. The middle ones, those are the ones that act like everyone needs to give them money to do every little thing that they do. My problem with this whole thing is, is editors, because I went through this with um, promoters, band promoters. Bands used to play shows. And all over the, all over town, in Orange County and LA County, they used to play shows. They used to make flyers. They used to bring people to the shows. They would get paid for playing the shows, based off a of head count and all this other shit. Then, certain clubs in Hollywood started saying, "You know what? This club is so popular that if you want to play here, I'm going to give you." And this wasn't even the club. This is a promoter whose job is supposed to put shows on. The promoter's like, I'll give you tickets and you sell all the tickets. And if you don't sell all the tickets, you have to pay me for the tickets that you didn't sell. So the promoter is getting paid for a sellout every night, no matter what happens. And if the band shows up and doesn't pay the promoter, then the promoter won't let the band play. Do you see what I'm saying? And then once Hollywood started doing that, all the places started doing that. It took a little bit, but I'm pretty sure most places still do that. Like, that's why I stopped playing locally and started touring as much as I did. 
because when you tour, you don't have to do that shit. The promoters take care of shit. As they fucking should, because it's their fucking job. Just like an editor is supposed to run a magazine. It's their fucking job. If they don't want to do that, they could be a waiter, a waitress, they could sell cars, they could do anything they fucking want. And most of these people have jobs anyway. So why do this other thing if you're going to fucking half-ass it and you don't even really want to do it? I don't know. But when you normalize this thing where, okay, writers, you have to pay for me to give you the privilege of me reading your work because this is fucking hard. This is hard work. Once you normalize that, everyone will do it and everyone will ask for money and it'll be harder and harder for people to submit to more and more magazines. And I guarantee the money that you will be getting from submitting to magazines will be less than the money that you spent submitting to the magazines. You see what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's a bad thing that does not look like it's going to get any better unless people realize that, I don't know, just like, like there were so many other things, like they put the magazine up on their website for free because no one will pay for it. Right. But like, like Amazon has made a whole subcategory for people buying digital magazines. People do it all the fucking time. So you're saying that the words on the page aren't enough and that's not the art. The true art is paper. The true art is printed paper that you could hold in your hand. It has nothing to do with the words that are on it. That's fucking bullshit. And this kind of came up when I was on Slee Ricketts the other night. That the, the poem itself is free. Like the words are free. No one can no one can actually like make any money off of the words they write. It's like, what are the words on? That's what that's what matters. That's fucking crazy. Oh, oh my god, I'm losing it. I'm losing it. Okay, let's just let's get off this because I'm getting all fucking upset now. So anyway, Jeff, thank you for the comment. As you say, you don't think it's too much to ask. It's not too much to ask, but if everyone asks it, it will be too much. They can't take advantage of people with good hearts. Because, like, you're a good fucking dude. So, of course, you're going to want to fucking help them out, dude. <sighs> That's how I see it anyway. So, God, I'm so fucking annoyed right now. This whole topic has just really... It just leaves a nasty taste in my mouth. Basically, what I've come to realize is that I speak up for people like I speak up for people who like I feel like aren't talking and I'm not doing it to be like hey I'm the leader being and I'm gonna talk for us I do it because when I see these things it makes me sick and it makes me mad and I'm dumb enough to open my mouth I know a lot of people don't appreciate some of the things that I say, but I also get a lot of really healthy, happy compliments, I guess is the best way to put it, from a lot of you who appreciate the things I say because I say things that you would never say. And I understand that. I understand that not everyone is... I don't want to say stupid as me, but I'm trying to think of a better thing and I can't come up with anything because I'm a writer. Like a lot of you were just more reserved and the thought of just exploding your mouth at something is not anything that will ever happen. I do that and it's exhausting. I'm getting really fucking tired of having to talk about the shit that I talk about. I would rather just fucking write poems and put poems out and help you guys put poems out and start a fucking revolution of motherfuckers putting out fucking poetry, you know? I, that's what I would love to do. But things don't work like that. Like, when you have a revolution, like, there are words that need to be spoken, there are things that need to be done, 
there are people that you need to pull together. There are, um, I don't know. And I don't want to turn this into like this big fucking like revolution, even though I already used that word. I just don't know what else to fucking say. Because the things I'm talking about seem like common fucking sense. But to a lot of people I talk to, they seem revolutionary. And the only reason why they would seem revolutionary is if you have been told a bunch of crap and bullshit and it been told to you to normalize a bunch of bullshit that is crap. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just wish, like, for all of the sticklers out there who absolutely hate what I do and um, try to insult me and insult my work by saying what I do is not blank. I wish you guys would just like go fuck off and just like write good poems. Like don't worry about what I'm doing. Don't worry about telling me what the things I'm doing are. Just go write better poems. If you are so fucking knowledgeable about all this shit, go off, write better poems, do your fucking thing, because I don't give a shit what you guys write. I don't give a shit about what you guys do. Do whatever the fuck you want. You know, like, I know you don't think the customer is always right. Obviously, you think you're always right. But if I'm selling my poetry and you are obscure, you know, if you're happy with that, then good. And I'm glad you're happy. Keep writing that poem and make it better than anything I've ever done. Just write the best poetry possible. Go. And what's the judge of the best? Whatever you think it is. Go do that. I don't give a shit about you and what you write. Uh, like, here's the thing, guys. If anyone out there ever tells you what you're doing is not poetry or is not good or you don't have talent or blah, 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 unless you're paying them for an opinion or something and like you're like, okay, hey, can you please critique this because I'm giving you money and I need to know, blah, blah, blah. If people are just saying this shit, that usually means that they're totally insecure with, about their own work and they need some kind of system of judgment in order to feel like they are important and that the words they say have meaning. Because living in a world where like... Everything is just up to interpretation and people's own enjoyment levels makes them feel like the world is falling apart, makes them feel like it's anarchy in the streets and dogs are fucking cats and like chickens and cows are running through the streets, burning in flames and like little kids are just sitting on the curbs eating popcorn and laughing, you know, because it's a control thing. And I don't want to say that it's like this like white, elite, privileged thing. But I find it strange that the people who want to control the quality of what's happening, for the most part, tend to be older white dudes. Like there are plenty of women and people of color who fall into those categories too. When things happen that are similar, you point stuff out. And like, well, here's one of the things. Like when Bucks was on my show and he was talking about the Baltimore poetry scene, he was saying how like there was just all sorts of different kinds of stuff, but like, none, like, like natural selection was not working. Like no matter how bad something was, it was still there and it was still going. Now, here is the thing about this. And this is the thing about art. If people aren't buying an artist's art, whether it is written word, paints, whatever, music, if no one is enjoying that, if no one is 
showing up at these events, if no one is applauding wildly for these people, that's where the natural selection part comes in. That's where, like, like no one likes this guy's stuff. He's eventually going to, like, walk home with his tail between his legs and either figure out how to do better or, I don't know, become a CPA. All right? That is how natural selection works. And I know, I know so many of you out there hate when I put monetary goals on art. But after looking at that bullshit about that lit mag, looking for grants and um, philanthropist money and all this shit, the fact that you think putting money on art is disgusting is the biggest hypocritical bullshit joke I've ever fucking heard. Because, like, the money you're asking for, you're asking for it just because and not because if people actually like it. You want some just because money. Okay? And to me, that's fucking a hundred times worse than having money because people like what you're doing. Okay, so think about that for a minute. So now we go back to this Baltimore scene. If the people who are really bad do not get the applause, do not get people buying their books, do not get accepted in zines and literary journals around, if none of the stuff happens, natural selection will take place and that person will disappear. Okay? But if people enjoy themselves when this person reads or when this person performs, if people like the words that this person puts on a page, if people like the paint that this person lays on a canvas, if people like all of this stuff, then that is the thing that's going to exist. But the thing here is, if you're the only person that doesn't like that thing, you are the thing that natural selection is weeding out. And that's the thing here. Because what I think is really happening here is that a lot of these people who think everything in the world sucks except what they do, or that the majority of everything out there is awful except the stuff that they like, those are the people who are going to disappear. And another thing about this is, is like people talk about formal poetry like getting smaller and getting smaller. If the idea for a formal poet is to put out a book, and I'm going to be generous and say, like maybe every five years, after hearing um, Bucks and Alexis on the last Lee Ricketts episode talk about this, they were saying like seven to ten years, okay? So I'm not good at math. Bucks already knows that. We, we, we've discussed this before. <laughs> But if you take the dwindling amount of formalist poets and the ridiculous gaps between how often they publish their work and then your free verse world that's just growing and growing and growing and growing and getting more popular and more popular and all this stuff. If this is happening like this, eventually, like in 40 years... 50 years. Is there even going to be a formalist poetry scene at all? Will there be formalist poets anymore? Or will it be just something like a few people do is like a fun like game. It's like playing cards against humanity or something like, Oh, let's, let's write a sonnet. That's fucking fun. Let's do that guys. Yeah. Weird. Okay. Fun. You know what I'm saying? And some of you might be saying, well, that's what poetry should be. People should be writing sonnets for fun. Okay. But if you're going to get pissed off that the rest of the poetry world has, like, left you behind, then isn't that something that you want to talk about or think about? Or, like, what's going on here? Like, just by numbers, if you do not publish very often... 10 years apart sometimes 
and they're getting fewer and fewer, those people are getting older and older. They're only going to be able to put out so many more books before they're dead. And if the whole formless mantra is seven to ten years between books and that number is dwindling, like it will eventually disappear. Like, I'm not trying to be an alarmist here. I'm just trying to be like, duh, you know. But that, I guess, is my spiel for today. It's kind of a all over the place episode. Let's get into it here. So here we go. Let Us Bleed, um, the new chapbook by myself and Bunny Wild. It's here. It's up my Etsy shop. It's like 36 or 40 pages. Um, newsprint interior with a glitter cardstock, red glitter cardstock. Um, this is, there's only 30 copies of this available. And. Um, there's 10 poems by Bunny and 10 poems by me. And this Thursday, I'm going to be recording an episode of the podcast with Bunny where we talk about this book and putting this book together and um, kind of what it means to both of us. Um, so that's going to be really, really fun. I can't wait for that. And so moving into the butt plug territory, I want to give a big thank you to all those motherfuckers that make this show possible. I want to give a thank you to my fuckers over on Patreon. Michael, Cedar, Harry, you guys are awesome. Over at the Thank You Crew on YouTube, I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia. You guys are awesome. Uh, and then over in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas, to Tim, Jay, to Shaylin, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to JH, to Chase, and to Tim G., you guys are the shit. Thank you so much. And the biggest of all thank yous goes to you know who, the number one chappy. Over there in the Chapbook of the Month Club, I want to thank you, Caitlin. Without you in my life, I'd slowly wilt and die. Um, so there you go. For all of you huge poetry fans, tell me who pegged that one. I was going to read a poem. I guess I still will. Um, I don't want to read that poem because I read that in a video. So, um, again, um, the Anarchy Crew, actually everyone in any level on my membership on YouTube, we're doing the Bukowski Book Club um, where we're going through all of Bukowski's poetry books every month. And this month of May is wrapping up. And um, this month we did The Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills. This is one of my favorite poems in here. Um, I have basically two because to me, this book is broken up into two sections. There's the section of poems about Jane, who was his like first love and then poems about everything else. And for, for the Jane poems, this is my favorite poem and it's actually called for Jane. 225 days under grass and you know more than I, they have long taken your blood you are a dry stick in a basket. Is this how it works? In this room, the hours of love still make shadows. When you left, you took almost everything. I kneel in the nights before tigers that will not let me be. What you were will not happen again. The tigers have found me, and I do not care. So... I fucking love this poem and the opening line of it. 225 days under grass and you know more than I. So that's what, like, probably like nine months or so after she died, he wrote this. Um, it's just fucking tragic. I fucking love that. Like, she knows what the fucking score is. She knows what happens afterwards. She has all the answers now, um, or there are no answers, but either way, she knows, and he doesn't. The sale. It's May 28th right now. This will probably be up on May 30th, and I think there's 31 days in May. Okay, so that means you still have one more day to grab that kick-ass sale on my Etsy shop where the majority of my chapbooks are only five bucks. 
So jump in there, grab that while you can, um, and let me know what you got. Like, let, let us all know. Tell us what you did. Tell us what you got. And, um, yeah, so type art, everybody. Join the Anarchy Crew, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give quick thanks to those people who will make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate all you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew in the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. If you'd like to become a member of Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.